All right, the title of the sermon this morning is The Truth About Repentance. The Truth About Repentance. It's going to be a bit of a refresher for those of you who are regular at our church, but uh, for those of you who haven't heard me preach on this topic, I think it'll be uh, very good for you to get uh, solid in uh, the uh, biblical uh, understanding of repentance when it comes to various topics, because they're isn't only one thing you can repent of, and that's what we are going to learn about today in this sermon. So the truth about repentance. Now, first of all, I just want to address the false accusation that a lot of people will level at our church or people that believe like us when they tell us, uh, you know, we don't believe in repentance. We don't believe in repentance. We do believe in repentance. But what I want to make very clear is, you know, we believe salvation is by grace through faith, not of works. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. This is a really good passage to show anyone that believes, oh, you know, I've got to do good to get to heaven. I've got to be good. I've got to keep good works. I've got to do good deeds in order to get to heaven. It's very clear that the Bible says we are not saved by works. We're saved by grace through faith. It's not something that you do. It is something that God does. We receive grace through faith. Another very clear passage is Romans 4, 5, and 6. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness. What does it mean to impute? It's like to credit to your account without works. So it's without works. We're not saved by works. Some people get this idea, yeah, I know I'm not saved by works. Jesus does most of it, but I've got to do my part. No, that doesn't work that way. You can't mix grace and works. Romans 11, 6. If by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. So you've got to think of it like when you buy something, that's by works. But if you get something, by free, get something for free by grace, you can't pay a little bit for it. You might get a discount. You might get it for cheap, but that's not grace. And it's the same with salvation. We receive eternal life as a gift. It's not by works. It's not something you have to do less works for now that Jesus Christ has died on the cross for your sins. No, it's by grace. It's not of works. And in fact, if you try and get it by works, you won't have it at all. So people will falsely accuse us of removing repentance from the gospel. They'll say, the way you preach the gospel, you're, you're removing repentance. No, 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 we just have a, a, the right understanding of repentance. And before people say, like, well, when you, when you preach the gospel, you know, you've got to use the word repentance. You've got to say repentance. You know, John the Baptist said repentance, and Jesus said repentance. You, you know, when you preach the gospel, you've got to tell people to repent. Well, I don't know if you know this, but... In the Gospel of John, you know, the Gospel of John, we read this. It says here, in many other signs, this is at the end of the Gospel of John, many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But watch this, but these are written. So what? The miracles that John wrote in his Gospel, he says, but these are written, that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. So in the second last chapter of John's Gospel, he says the reason why I am writing these works that Jesus has done in my Gospel so that you might believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that believing you might have life through his name. Now, did you know that a book that claims to be written that you might believe on Jesus Christ, that you might believe the gospel, does not use the word repent even once. (gasps) It's like, did John leave something out? No. So see, we're not leaving anything out just because we say, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. We are just being specific about the repentance that is required to get saved. And that's a change in your life beliefs. But we're going to talk about in this sermon, you know, different things that you can repent from and get, give you a good understanding of repentance in the Bible. Now, I understand people's concerns. 
when they talk about, yeah, well, if you tell people that they just need to believe on Jesus Christ and then they can live however they want, they'll still be saved, then they're, they're going to take advantage of that. They're going to live however they want. You're not going to get the sort of behavior you may want in a believer because people are just going to live however they want. It's going to give them a license to sin, which is not true, which is not true, but that's what people say. And I understand people have a concern there about Christians that are not striving to be Christ-like. But let me ask you, is the solution to get people to do what they ought and keep God's commandments, strive to keep God's commandments, is the solution to that problem to change the gospel? We don't change the gospel. We don't preach a false gospel. We don't preach heresy to get people to change their behavior. I mean, we just need to add an emphasis on repentance of sin in the Christian life. But we should preach the gospel purely, right, correctly, not add repentance of sins to salvation. And this is a problem in a lot of churches. They have a lot of, people have a lot of misunderstanding about this topic. And even though they claim, and this is where you come across you know, fundamental Bible-believing Christians that will claim, yeah, they know salvation is by works, they say salvation is by grace, but they're worried in the back of their mind that if they don't live right, maybe they're not saved. If they don't live right, maybe they'll lose their salvation. Why? Because then they come to church and then they learn, you need to repent of your sins to be saved. You need to repent of your sins to be saved. And they're like, oh man, have I really repented of all my sins? I haven't repented of all my sins. I still sin. So am I saved? So it's a very damaging doctrine to the stability of people's spiritual life. So, but, you know, John the Baptist, Jesus and the apostles all preached repentance. Yes, no one is arguing that repentance is in the Bible and that repentance is required for salvation. The question really is, what does repentance mean? And does it always mean to turn from your sins? And it doesn't. And I'll show you here. We're going to go through four different types of repentance or four things that you can repent from in the Bible. And I'll give you some examples as we go through it. And then you'll see where uh, Ezekiel 18 kind of ties into this. But the first one, the first thing that you can repent from is you can repent from evil. You can repent from evil. Repentance from evil. Now what is evil? Evil is when you are going to cause harm to another person. And not all evil is sinful, right? So you might think, oh, all evil is sinful. No, because God sometimes will do evil to a nation, and that's not sinful, right? But he will cause harm to a nation. We see here in Jonah 3 the evil that God thought to do to Nineveh. So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast. So we don't probably have to tell you the story of Jonah, you know, he's swallowed by the, the fish, right? The whale. The whale is a fish, right? Swallowed by the fish. Three and three days, three days goes and preaches to Nineveh, right? He preaches that they should turn from their evil ways. And they do. So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. For word came unto the king of Nineveh and he rose from his throne and he laid his robe from him and covered him with sackcloth and sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock taste anything. Let them, feed, let them not feed nor drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn everyone from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hand. The one thing you have to understand about Old Testament passages is that sometimes there's a physical application and there's a spiritual application. Right? So the physical application is, yes, if this nation actually changed and turned from their sins, God would spare them physical judgment. But we're going to talk about the spiritual application as we go into turning from dead works and looking at Ezekiel. Verse 9, who can tell if God will turn, look at this, and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not? Now, see, this verse proves that repentance cannot in and of itself, that word alone, mean to turn from sins. Because if it means to turn from sins, then how does God repent? But you see here, it says, who can tell if God will turn and repent? So you see here, repent or turn just means to change from something. But the question is, what are you changing from? What is God changing from? Well, he's changing from the evil 
that he's going to do to the nation of Nineveh and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not. Now verse 10, look at this. And God saw their works that they turned from their evil way. So what did God see? He saw that they turned from their evil way. And what did he call that? Works. That's why if somebody says you need to repent of your sins to be saved, if you need to turn from your evil way to be saved, that's just another way to say you've got to work your way to heaven. You've got to keep the commands to be saved. It's a works gospel. God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God repented. God repented of the evil that he said that he would do unto them, and he did it not. So you see there that repentance in and of itself is not a turning away from sin. A repentance is a turning. But a turning from what? What we're talking about here is you can turn away from doing evil. God can turn away from doing evil. So this is not always a turning from sin because God also repents from evil that he thought to do unto them and he did it not. Jeremiah 18 verse 7. At what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to pluck up and to pull down and to destroy it. If that nation against whom I have pronounced turn from their evil, I will repent of the evil that I thought to do unto them. So you see here, not only can man repent from doing evil to other men, but also God can repent from evil. And oftentimes, if you look up in your Bible, repent, repentance, repenteth, repentest, all the different forms of repent in the Bible, you'll find that God actually does a lot more repenting in the Old Testament than man does. So we have one. We have repentance from evil. So that's where they are going to do evil and they decide not to do it. That's a repentance from evil. Number two is a repentance from good. A repentance from doing good. So you don't only repent from doing something harmful or doing something bad. You can actually repent from doing something good as well to somebody. Jeremiah 18, we'll continue to read in Jeremiah 18, verse 9. We'll see here repentance from doing good. And what instance? I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to build and to plant it. If it do evil in my sight that it obey not my voice, then I will repent of the good wherewith I said I would benefit them. So you see here, God is not here in repenting from evil. He is repenting from doing good. Good. Genesis 6, we see God repenting again after he had made man. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Look at this, verse 6. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. Now, if you remember in the six days of creation, Genesis 1, and in, you know, it goes over more in day 6 in Genesis 2. But you remember when God rested the seventh day, he said he looked at everything he'd made and he said, behold, it was very good. Right? So that included him creating Adam you know, and creating Eve. But here in Genesis 6, when the world is getting wicked to the point where he decides to flood the whole earth, save uh, Noah and his family, ate in the ark, it says here in verse 6, it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him at his heart. So you see that God is repenting from a good that he had done and now the good that he had done has grieved him because the good that he had done has now used its free will to sin and cause a lot of violence in the earth. So just covering those two very quickly, we've got repentance from evil and we have repentance from good. Now let's get into the more common ones that people uh, misunderstand and where we have to spend most of our time. Uh, number three is there is in the Bible a repentance from sin, a repentance from sin. And we'll go back to Ezekiel 18 because this is where we see the repentance from sin that is preached under the Old Covenant, right? Which is the Old Covenant. If you remember in Deuteronomy where God said to Moses, Behold, this day I set a blessing and a curse before you. A blessing if you'll keep the commandments of God and a curse if you'll disobey the commandments of God. This is why you see preaching throughout the Old Testament of a turning from sin, of a keeping from, of commandments in order to obtain the mercy of God because that is the Old Covenant. Now the problem is with the Old Covenant is that we cannot keep it. 
We cannot keep salvation by works, and that's why the new covenant came in, which is, is a salvation by grace, and this is how we turn from our sins, by putting our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Ezekiel 18, But if the wicked will turn from all his sins that he hath committed, and keep all my statutes, and do that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live, he shall not die. So what is this talking about? There's two applications here, like we saw in, in uh, Jonah 3. Right? There is the physical wrath of God that's going to come on this nation like it almost came on the nation of Nineveh, like it came on Sodom and Gomorrah. Right? The physical judgment. It's an example of things to come. Right? Like Sodom and Gomorrah is an example of hell, you know, of people that will not believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You have also here, this is an example of that if somebody will turn from their sins, how do they do that in the new covenant? They believe on Jesus Christ. They don't do it by their own righteousness, like in Romans 10. Right? They need to submit to the righteousness of Christ, which is by faith. But what we see here, and what I think this really makes clear in Ezekiel 18, is when you tell somebody to turn from their sins, what are you actually telling them to do? You see, if somebody is lying, and you say you need to turn from that sin, what are they doing? Aren't they ceasing from lying now? But when you cease from lying, from bearing false witness, what commandment are you keeping? You're keeping the ninth commandment, right? That thou shalt not lie. So I always remember lying nine. That's how you remember the ninth commandment is thou shalt not bear false witness. So you see how when you turn from a sin, you have to keep a commandment to turn from a sin. So that's why when you say repent of your sins, turn from your sins, all you're saying, using different words, is keep the commandments. You see, if you're, if you're fornicating and you turn from that sin, you stop fornicating. So you're keeping the commandment to flee from fornication. So you see, you turn from sins by keeping the commandments. So these are one and the same thing. You can't say, yeah, you have to keep the commandments, but that's not what I mean when I say turn from my sins. No, turning from your sins is keeping the commandments. Right? If, you, if you mean something else when you say turn from your sins or repent of your sins, you should probably use different words. Because you know? the words that you're saying mean keep the commandments. But if the wicked will turn from all his sins that he had committed, look at this, and keep all my statutes. So you see how they come hand in hand? Because if you turn from all your sins and don't do anything, you haven't really turned from all your sins. I mean, you turn from all your sins, what you do is you keep all my statutes and do that which is lawful and right. He shall surely live, he shall not die. All his transgressions that he hath committed, they shall not be mentioned unto him. In his righteousness that he hath done, he shall live. Have I any pleasure at all that the wicked should die, saith the Lord God, and not that he should return from his ways and live? But when the righteous turneth away from his righteousness and committeth iniquity. So you see there, that's the opposite. That's not the turning away from sin. That's the turning away from doing good. And then what's that? Committing iniquity. And doeth according to all the abominations that the wicked man doeth, shall he live? All his righteousnesses that he hath done shall not be mentioned. In his trespass that he hath trespassed, and in his sin that he hath sinned, in them shall he die. Yet ye say, the way of the Lord is not equal. Hear now, o house of Israel, is not my way equal, are not your ways unequal. So this is saying God, this is how God will deal with it physically. And also spiritually, right? Because if somebody believes on the Lord Jesus Christ, they get saved. And sometimes you'll have people say that to you. That They'll say, oh yeah, but so you're telling me that if somebody's like a lying, a thieving, an adulterer, and he's, and he's committed murder, but then he believes on Jesus Christ before his deathbed, he gets to go to heaven. But, you know, the, it's always the old granny, right? The old granny that like hasn't done anything wrong and, you know, she's always gone to church. And this old granny is always perfect. I remember this old granny was a young granny once. And she was just as sinful as all the other young people, right? So we're all sinners, but you no, know, grandma is always nice to everyone, baking cookies and, you know, doing everything with Sunday school. But then, oh, you know, she just tells one lie. She's going to go to hell for all eternity. That's always the picture that they paint. But doesn't that, that's like what they're saying here. That's like, that's like people saying, is the Lord's way is unequal. And God is saying, here now, O house of Israel, is not my way equal. Are not your ways unequal? Yes, if somebody believes on Jesus Christ and they've committed all these sins, they will be saved. But the person who has committed less sins is still worthy of hell. They do not believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. They will die spiritually right, and end up in hell. 
That is fair. That is how God has done it. Because you know what? The old granny that supposedly did all the good and just committed one sin, they could believe on the Lord Jesus Christ too. Right? So it's fair. They need to believe on Jesus Christ. Everyone needs to believe on Jesus Christ. That's fair. When a righteous man turneth away from his righteousness and committeth iniquity and dieth in them, for his iniquity that he hath done shall he die. Again, when the wicked man turneth away from his wickedness that he hath committed and doeth that which is lawful and right, he shall save his soul alive because he considereth and turneth away from all his transgressions that he hath committed. He shall surely live. He shall not die. Yet saith the house of Israel, the way of the Lord is not equal. O house of Israel, are not my ways equal? Are not your ways unequal? So again, when you read Old Testament passages, you've got to remember that sometimes the house of Israel is representing unbelievers and sometimes the house of Israel is representing believers. So you don't always want to just take Old Testament passages and misinterpret them. You need to interpret Old Testament passages using the New Testament. Because a lot of people can take Old Testament passages. Like, yeah, I mean, you, could I, you, I could take this passage and preach heresy and preach a work salvation. But I'll show you here that anyone that's preaching work salvation using these sort of passages is not using them consistently. Therefore I will judge you, O house of Israel, this is verse 30, everyone according to his ways, saith the Lord. Repent and turn yourselves from all your transgressions, so iniquity shall not be your ruin. So again, repent of your sin is just another way to say, keep the commandments. Now, somebody might say to that, yeah, well, when I say repent of your sins, I don't mean um, you, you need to repent, you know, you don't actually need to repent of your sins. They'll say, you just have to be willing to turn from your sin. You don't actually, because everybody sins, so they say, you don't, just, you don't have to repent of all your sins, you just have to be willing to repent of all your sins. I'm sure you guys have heard people say that. Well, if you look at passages like this, which is a lot of the passages that the repent of your sins to be saved crowd will say, did, I don't remember here reading re, repent and be willing to turn yourselves from all your transgressions. Now, the Bible says repent and turn yourselves from all your transgressions. So there's no willingness here. And the question really is, if someone doesn't actually stop sinning, were they actually willing to turn from their sins? That's what they always say. They'll say like, oh, you say, well, I'm willing to do this. I'm willing to do that. I'm willing to go to the church. Well, if you're not actually at church, were you willing to go to church? So you see how willing just always turns into you must actually do it. Because if you don't actually do it, then you weren't actually willing. Right? So they'll say you have to be willing to repent of your sins. You don't actually have to repent of your sins. But if you don't repent of your sins, then you weren't actually willing. That's how it always comes back. And here, it doesn't even say here that you have to repent of some of your sins. Notice it says, it says, repent and turn yourselves from all your transgressions so that iniquity shall not be your ruin. And this is why this is not possible. It's not possible to turn away from all your sins because even when we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, we still continue to sin. And this is why we need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And the last point I just want to make about this passage and just about all this whole repent of your sins to be saved is even if somebody says you need to be willing to repent of your sins, why do you need to be willing to do something that's not even required for salvation? Do you know what I mean? Like, you're not required to keep the commandments for salvation. You're not required to repent of your sins. So why should you be willing to do it? It's like if I gave you something for free. You didn't have to pay for it. But then you had to be willing to pay for it to get something for free. It's like, why did you need to be willing to do something to get something for free that didn't require you to get it for free? It does not make sense, right? It's free. You don't need to be willing to do something that is irrelevant to receiving it in the first place. So you have repentance of sins. So you have it in the Old Testament, right, where it's turning from your sins in order to save yourself from God's physical judgment. And that's a picture in the New Testament. We'll talk about that and the last point. But we also see here an exhortation for believers to repent of their sins because is there anything wrong with repenting of your sins? No, you just have to have it in the right place. Right? It's like baptism. Baptism is a beautiful thing, but you need to have it in the right place. It's after salvation. If you have it before salvation, it's heresy. Right? You have to, like, like what they say, baptismal regeneration. You need to be baptized in order to be saved. That's an abomination. Right? That's heresy. You have to have it in the right place. So it's the same with repenting of your sins. Repenting of your sins is a good thing. 
something that we ought to strive for, something we have to work on every day. But is it something that we need to do in order to be saved? No. And if we teach that and we believe that, that's heresy. Right? Because it's work salvation. Revelation 3. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou wert cold or hot. You see, God wants you to be extreme. He hates Christians that are lukewarm. They're in the middle, on the fence. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. What is this saying? It's saying it makes God sick. This is not saying that it's, you're going to lose your salvation. Right? Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. And knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Right? He wants us to change. He wants us to, from going from lukewarm to being hot. Right? He said, you'd rather you be cold than lukewarm. Right? Because obviously, usually lukewarm does more damage than Christians just being cold. But he would rather, obviously, us be hot rather than cold. So this is what he's talking about here. So he's commanding a church to actually repent of their sins and actually do right. right. But this has nothing to do with salvation. This is an exhortation in order to do right. Believers repenting of their sins. Here's an example in Acts 8 as well. But there was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that himself was some great one. So I'm going to this passage because Simon the sorcerer is often used as an example where people say, ah, oh, here is somebody where Peter told Simon the sorcerer to repent of his sins in order to get saved. But what I want to show you here in Acts 8 is Simon the sorcerer was already saved. So what was he being told to repent from later on in the chapter? So he's a sorcerer here, it's setting the scene. Verse 10, to whom they, so the people of Samaria that were bewitched by him, to, to whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, this man is the great power of God. So he was bewitching people into thinking he had the power of God when he's not, right? He's just tricking people, right? A bit like Benny Hinn, right? Benny Hinn, he tricks people, he's doing all that stuff. And a lot of people that have gone to his crusades, they say there's a bunch of actors there, just like falling over and doing stuff. I have no doubt. And to him they had regard, because that of a long time he had bewitched them with sorceries. But when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Look at this. Then Simon himself believed also. And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. Now we're going to skip down to verse 18. So we see here Simon the sorcerer is saved. He's believed. He's baptized. We know because the, the author of Acts is telling us this is what happened. Right? This is not Simon claiming to be saved. This is the author of Acts saying, yes, Simon believed and was baptized. So we know he is saved. Verse 18, And when Simon saw that through, laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Ghost was given. He offered them money. Right? So he's seeing uh, Philip doing all these miracles. Right? But Philip's not able to pass this power on him. And if you remember in Acts 8, the apostles then came down, laid their hands on people, and then they were able to have these gifts that Philip had also. So Simon saw the apostles had this power to impart this gift. He wanted that power as well. And what did he do to try and get that power? He offered the money. He's like, can I pay you some money so that you'll give me this ability to be able to lay hands on people and impart gifts of the Holy Ghost? Saying, give me also this power that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. And this is why I believe in this chapter we see that only the apostles, there were only a select few men that were able to impart these gifts. Because why didn't he offer Philip money to impart these gifts? Because Philip was not able to impart these gifts because Philip was just a deacon. Right? He was given these gifts, but he was not able to impart them. And this is why uh, I believe these, uh, these gifts have ceased because they were signs of the apostles. Verse 19, saying, Give me also this power that whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. Verse 20, But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, 
because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. So there's an application to salvation here as well, as well as the ability to be able to impart gifts. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent, therefore, of this thy wickedness, and pray God if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven him. What? So what is he telling him specifically to, to, to repent from? It's not repent from sins in order to be saved. And, and here, Peter doesn't even know if Simon the sorcerer is saved, because Simon the sorcerer has just come to him saying he's going to give him money in order to get this gift. But we know from the chapter that Simon the sorcerer is saved. Right? But Peter says to him that he is, needs to repent from this thought that he can buy this power of the Holy Gift of the Holy Ghost with money. That's what he's telling him to repent from. This is not a passage talking about repenting of sins in order to be saved. For I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. Then answered Simon and said, Pray ye to the Lord for me, that none of these things which ye have spoken come upon me. So he immediately has the right response where he says, Well, this I've done wrong here and pray that none of these things that you've said will actually happen to me. Now, two more passages I just want to touch on in this section of repenting from sins. And it's just common passages that people go to to talk about repenting of sins to be saved, which I believe they're misunderstanding. 2 Corinthians 7. This is when Paul talks about writing a letter to the Corinthian church and saying that he repents from writing the letter, but he doesn't repent, so he ends up sending it. And we have a passage in here that when we come across, you'll see. 2 Corinthians 7, verse 8. For though I made you sorry with a letter, I do not repent, though I did repent. For I perceive that the same epistle hath made you sorry, though it were but for a season. So it might be a bit confusing here what he's saying, but what he's basically saying is, because the Corinthian church was having all these problems, Right? fornication in the church and just bickering and not abusing the Lord's Supper, all these sorts of things. So he writes them a letter sort of rebuking all these things. And now he's writing the second letter, reflecting on the first letter, uh, grateful that they actually did something in the church about it, right? like doing something even about the person that was committing fornication. Right? And the guy got right. But what is he saying here in verse 8? He's saying, though I made you sorry with a letter, he made, he made you guys upset, he says, I don't repent. I'm not, I don't, I'm not going to change. I didn't change about writing the letter. I didn't change my mind about writing the letter. But he says, though I did repent. So there was a time, probably when the letter was in transit, that he's thinking, oh man, maybe I shouldn't have wrote this letter. You know, because maybe they're not going to take it the right way. Or, you know, maybe I should talk to them. And sometimes we should have that thought too. You're about to send that text and you go, you know, maybe you should repent. Maybe you should like not hit send. Call them. I do not repent. Though I did repent. But he's saying, hey, he didn't repent. Why? Because I perceive that the same epistle had made you sorry, though it were, but for a season. So just for a temporary time, verse 9. Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that you sorrowed to repentance. For you were made sorry after a godly manner, that you might receive damage by us in nothing. So he's saying he's not happy just because he made them sad. He's saying he's happy that he made them sad, but that sadness led to a change of doing something in the church. For you were made sorry after a godly manner that you might receive damage by us in nothing. Verse 10. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. Now, somebody that believes that you have to repent of your sins to be saved, and I think I've already sort of shown you that that's like a works-based salvation, but they'll interpret this passage to say, to say see, they had, the Corinthian church had to repent of your sins, and they'll interpret verse 10 to say, hey, see, it's, it's this repentance of sins that leads people to salvation, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. And then we'll keep reading, and then I'll explain to you what I believe this is talking about. For behold, this selfsame thing that ye sorrowed after a godly sort, what carefulness it wrought in you, yea, what clearing of yourselves, yea, what indignation, yea, what fear, yea, what vehement desire, yea, what zeal, yea, what revenge. In all things ye have approved yourselves to be clear in this matter. Now what Paul is talking about here is he's not making a point. He's not talking 
like he has mentioned salvation and he's talking about repenting of your sins in order to get right in the Corinthian church. But what people misunderstand is the point that he's making here and why he's linking it to repentance to salvation. So what the point, the main point he's actually making here is he's talking about a difference between the right kind of sorrow and the wrong kind of sorrow. Right? So in the church, he could have written a letter and they could have got sad and he's like, hey, I'm writing a letter and they sorrowed, but they sorrowed to the wrong direction. Because sometimes when people get told off and they get rebuked, they get sorrowful and they get away from God rather than getting right with God, rather than doing the right thing and repenting of that sin and getting right. So it's saying here that he was glad that they had the right type of sorrow, that you were made sorrow, sorry after a godly manner. And then he links that same sorrow. He's saying it's the same type of sorrow that can lead somebody to repentance, to salvation. Right? So he's not talking about the type of repentance that leads to salvation. He's talking about the type of sorrow that leads somebody to get saved. Verse 10, for godly sorrow, this type of sorrow is the good type of sorrow I'm talking about, which led you to make a change in the church. It also leads people to make a change to believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. So how can the sorrow of the world can work death when it comes to salvation? Well, because sometimes people realize the sinfulness of their nature. They realize they can't save themselves, but then they end up joining a false religion. You know, they end up thinking, well, if I just go to communion enough, or if I just confess to the man in the booth enough, or if I just take, eat enough bread and wine, you know, I'm going to get saved. Or, you know, they, God forbid they go and become a Buddhist. You know, they realize there's problems in the world, not enough peace, they have sorrow, but is it a godly sorrow? Is it a, the right type of sorrow where it works death and ends, ends up putting them in a place where they actually believe the wrong thing and they end up going to hell. So this passage is about the difference between the types of sorrow, not the types of repentance there are. But there's still a change, but the type of sorrow that leads to change to salvation is believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. But he's here emphasizing the type of sorrow that can, if somebody has a godly sorrow over their sins, or they admit they're a sinner, they admit they believe, they, they deserve hell, that's the type of sorrow that will lead them to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. But the sorrow of the world worketh death. Verse 11, and you can see here where he's talking about the type of sorrow. For behold, this self same thing. So likewise, in this example, how you have sorrowed in the right sort of way, that sometimes that sorrow leads people to salvation, that ye sorrowed after a godly sort, what carefulness it wrought in you, yea, what clearing of yourselves, yea, what indignation, yea, what fear, yea, what vehement desire, yea, what zeal, yea, what revenge. In all these things, ye have approved yourselves to be clear in this matter. So this is talking about believers repenting from their sins in 2 Corinthians, but he links this to salvation because there is a godly sorrow involved in salvation, but it's not a turning from sins in order to be saved. It's a turning from dead works. And this is what we're going to talk about in this last section. Now, one last verse I just want to talk about when it comes to repenting from sin is we want to look at the story of Judas. Then Judas, which had betrayed him when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself and brought again the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned in that I have betrayed the innocent blood. And they said, What is that to us? See thou to that. And he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. Now what's interesting about this example with Judas is, here is a man that repented of his sins and he died and he went to hell. Why? Because you can turn from your sins. So that doesn't mean you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. See, Judas didn't believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah, he was sorry for what he did. He realized what he did was wrong, but he was not saved. So, repenting of your sins in and of itself cannot save you. But what's the last type of repentance? The last type of repentance. We have repentance from good, repentance from evil, repentance from evil, repentance from good, repentance from sin, which is where people misapply that one to salvation, because that would be work salvation. And then you have the one for salvation, the repentance for salvation is repentance from dead works. Hebrews 6, 
Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms and of laying out of hands and of resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. And this will we do if God permit. Now look at this. Repentance in Hebrews 6.1 is a principle of the doctrine of Christ. It's something foundational to Christianity. But look at the type of repentance that is foundational to Christianity. Is it repentance of sin? No, it says here, the foundation of repentance from dead works. Now, this is not a mistake. This is not a, like a coincidence. This is not like an accident. Repentance from dead works. What is dead works? Because I've had people tell me before, well, dead works is sin. No. Dead works is not sin. Why? Because nobody is trusting their sin to get them to heaven. So what is dead works? Dead works is when you are trusting good works in order to get you to heaven and therefore you're not saved. So if you think of dead works, is works without faith. Right? And that's you know, what you have to turn from in order to be saved. Putting your faith in good works. That's the person that says, I'm going to heaven because I'm pretty good. I'm going to heaven because I'm not a murderer. I'm going to heaven because I go to church. That's what somebody has to repent from in order to be saved. But they don't need to repent from fornication to be saved. They don't need to repent from drinking, drunkenness to be saved. All right? So dead works is works without faith. And you remember James 2? Faith without works is dead. So a dead faith is when you have faith without works. But Romans 4 is a dead worth, a dead faith can save you if it's on Jesus Christ. But here you have dead works, works without faith. So that's the repentance in regards to salvation, right? That is not the repentance of sin when it comes to salvation, right? That, that would be works. This is a foundational doctrine to Christianity. It's a principle of the doctrine of Christ, repentance from dead works. So if we know this, and then we go to Matthew 3, and Matthew 4, people will say, yeah, but John the Baptist preached repentance. Jesus preached repentance. We need to preach repentance. And what they mean by that usually is repent of your sins to be saved. But is that what they meant when they talk about repentance? In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So yes, they preached repentance. But I don't see repent of your sins there. The question is, what type of repentance are they preaching when it comes to salvation? Now, when Jesus has heard that John was cast into prison, he departed into Galilee. I just include that because I always find it interesting that Jesus only starts his preaching ministry once John has been shut in prison. And I just think that's very key there when John says, you know, I must decrease, he must increase. And really, he had to play that out. It wasn't just, you know, an analogy. He actually was shut in prison and not able to preach anymore. And this is when Jesus starts his preaching ministry. Verse 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So we say, well, how do you know, Victor, how do you know that repentance from dead works is what they meant when they said, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand? Well, not only do I have Hebrews 6, but the, thing, the great thing about this is in Acts 19, we don't even have to guess. We don't have to guess what you know, Paul and Peter and Jesus meant and John the Baptist meant when they preached, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Because in Acts 19, Paul actually defines what John the Baptist was preaching for us. Acts 19, what's happening here? Paul comes across people that are baptized but are not actually believers. They don't actually know what they believe. And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus and finding certain disciples. So these disciples, these were people following Jesus, right? Repenting of their sins, trying to keep the commandments. They're even baptized. But you know what? They're not saved. He said unto them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. So what have they done? It's like 1 Corinthians 15. They believed in vain. They believed the wrong thing. 
I don't even know what the Holy Ghost is. How can you be saved and not even know what the Holy Ghost is? This is what Paul said. And he said unto them in verse 3, Unto what then were you baptized? So he's like, who baptized you? And they said, unto John's baptism. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance. Look at this. Saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him. That is on Christ Jesus. So what was the baptism of repentance when John said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand and why he baptized people? Saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him. That is on Christ Jesus. So you see there that the repentance is a turning from dead works and believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not a repentance from sin. He wasn't saying unto the people the baptism of repentance that they should turn from sin. That they, that they should believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So this is why when we look at the other passages where John and Jesus preach repent, now with that understanding, you know what they're talking about. John did baptize in the wilderness and preach the baptism of repentance for the remission of sin. So what was he preaching? What was the baptism of repentance? Saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him. That is on Christ Jesus. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. That is the baptism of repentance. Verse 14. This is Jesus now. Now after that, John was put in prison. Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye. Look at this. And believe the gospel. So you see how it ties it together. What are they repenting from? Dead works and believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the repentance that is preached. Now I want to read through just some of Paul and Peter's preaching. And you'll see that this theme is very consistent even in their preaching. When they go and preach the gospel, you see that this baptism of repentance, this repentance for salvation is not turn from your sins, it's not the turn or burn gospel that you often hear street preachers talking about. Right? This is, that's a work salvation. Look at what he says here. This is his sermon in Acts 13, 17. It's a powerful passage. The God of this people of Israel chose our fathers and exalted the people when they dwelt as strangers in the land of Egypt, and with a high arm brought he them out of it. And about the time of forty years suffered he their manners in the wilderness, and when he had destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan, he divided their land to them by lot. And after that he gave unto them judges about the space of 450 years until Samuel the prophet. So he's given a history of the nation of Israel. And afterward they desired a king, and God gave unto them Saul, the son of Sis, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, by the space of 40 years. And when he had removed him, he raised up unto them David to be their king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I found David, the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. Of this man's seed, who, David, hath God, according to his promise, raised unto Israel a saviour, Jesus. Now he goes on to John the Baptist. When John had first preached before his coming the baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel, and as John fulfilled his course, he said, Who think ye that I am? I am not he. John saying, I'm not Jesus, I'm not the Messiah. But behold, there cometh one after me whose shoes of his feet I'm not worthy to loose. Men and brethren, children of the stock of Abraham, and whosoever among you feareth God, to you is the word of this salvation sent. For they that dwell at Jerusalem and their rulers, because they knew him not, nor yet the voices of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath day, they have fulfilled them in condemning him. And though they found no cause of death in him, yet desire they Pilate that he should be slain. And when they had fulfilled all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a sepulchre. But God raised him from the dead. And he was seen many days of them which came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are his witnesses unto the people. And we declare unto you glad tidings, how that the promise which was made unto the fathers, God hath fulfilled the same unto us, their children, in that he hath raised up Jesus again, as it is also written in the second psalm, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. 
And as concerning that he raised him up from the dead, now no more to return to corruption, he said on this wise, I will give you the sure mercies of David. Wherefore he saith also in another psalm, Thou shalt not suffer thine holy one to see corruption. For David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell on sleep and was laid unto his fathers and saw corruption. But he whom God raised again saw no corruption. Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins, look at this, and by him all that believe are justified from all things from which he could not be justified by the law of Moses. What is the law of Moses? It's the dead works. It's the, it's the, it's the, it's the righteousness by your own works. That's the law of Moses. Beware, therefore, lest that come upon you which is spoken of in the prophets. Behold, ye despisers and wonder and perish, for I work a work in your days, a work which ye shall in no wise believe, though a man declare it unto you. So you see there, that is God, John's message. That's the message of salvation. It's believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, that you need to believe on him. Acts 16, brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. That is the baptism of repentance. But here's also Peter preaching on repentance. And you'll see here that he has the same message. This is not something that is inconsistent throughout the Scriptures. Acts 10, 34, so to, to set the scene, this is when the Gentiles, if you remember Cornelius and his band, come to Peter because Cornelius gets the vision that he has to go and ask for Peter and hear words from him whereby him and his household will be saved. This is what Peter says to him. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. So he's just making the point there that God doesn't make a difference between people. If they do right, then he does right by them. If he doesn't, they do, and then, then they're in trouble as well. Verse 36. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. That word I say ye know, which was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached. He's saying here, I'm going to tell you the same thing that John preached, the same thing that Jesus preached, you've already heard it, all through Judea, began from Galilee up after the baptism which John preached. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all things which he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, who they slew and hanged on a tree. That's the crucifixion. Him God raised up the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, but unto witnesses chosen before of God, even to us who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. Well, that would have been awesome to be there. And he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of quick and dead. To him who, Jesus, give all the prophets witness that through his name, look at this, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. You see there the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins is something that all the prophets give witness to. It's through his name. Whosoever believeth him shall receive remission of sins. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. They of the circumcision were, they which believed were astonished as many as came with Peter because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water? that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we. And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed they him to tarry certain days. So you see here, and also even when he's given the account, I'll skip over this for sake of time, but even later when he's given the account to the Jews, when he talks about what happened, he even mentions in verse 17, see, he gave the gift like unto us as he did unto us, Verse 17, 
who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. What was I that I could withstand God? So you see there, he's even saying to the Jews, when I went and told them how we believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, they believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. And God poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost on them to show us that there's, God is no respecter of persons. So when you read a passage like 2 Peter 3, 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us with not willing that any should perish, so, but that all should come to repentance. Is this teaching you that you should repent of your sins to be saved? Well, if we look at what Peter preached, it's to him give all the prophets witness that through his name, all that believe right, are justified from all things from which it could not be justified by the law of Moses. Now the last passage I want to show you, and this really is kind of the nail in the coffin. Here is Jesus preaching on repentance. Jesus preaching on repentance. Now, we already saw when he said repent and believe the gospel, but here is where Jesus actually goes into a bit more depth and gives a parable and applies it to salvation and repentance. Matthew 21. And he was, when he was coming to the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came unto him as he was teaching and said, By what authority doest thou these things? And who gave thee this authority? Jesus answered and said unto him, I also will ask you one thing, which if you tell me, I in likewise will tell you by what authority I do these things. So he, he's answering a question with a question here. Verse 25, the baptism of John. Do so you see how he ties in John to what he's about to address with these people? The baptism of John, the baptism of repentance, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Whence was it? From heaven or of men? And they reasoned with themselves, saying, if we shall say from heaven... He will say unto us, why did he not then believe him? So they say, well, if John was from heaven, it's a bit like when we say to people about Jesus. We say like, is Jesus, was he crazy? Or is he the son of God? He can't be in the middle, he can't be a good teacher. Because you say, we'll say to him, is Jesus the son of God? Or is he a good teacher? They say he's the son of God, then you better believe him. You say he's a good teacher, why don't you believe the things that he taught? <laughs> Sometimes we'll say that to people. They won't admit that he's, uh, they don't believe that he's crazy or a lunatic. But if we shall say, verse 26, of men, we fear the people, for all hold John as a prophet. So they acknowledge that John is a prophet. But they don't want to say he's from God, because if he's from God, then they, then they say, God, Jesus will say, well, why don't you believe him? They answered Jesus and said, we cannot tell. And he said unto them, neither tell I you by what authority I do these things. But what think you? Here he goes into a parable. A certain man had two sons, and he came to the first and said, son, go work today in my vineyard. He answered and said, I will not. So this is the son saying, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to go work in my vineyard. But afterward, he repented and went. So you see, the parable that Jesus is giving is actually a parable of people, a son that is repenting from disobeying his father. Right? So he says, he says to the father, I'm not going to go. But then afterward, he repents from that and he goes. And he came to the second and said, likewise, and he answered, and, and he answered and said, I go, sir, and went not. So you see how there are these two sons. One says, I'm not going to go, but he goes, you know what, I better, go. I better go. So he goes. And then another son says, yeah, I am going to go. But then he doesn't end up going to go work in the vineyard. Verse 31, whether of them twain, so which of the two did the will of his father? They say unto him, the first, right? The one that actually did it. Not the one that just said he was going to do it and didn't do it. Jesus saith unto them. So now he is using this parable to explain a spiritual truth. Verily I say unto you that the publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. For John came unto you in the way of righteousness and ye believed him not. Right? The, the message of the baptism of repentance. But the publicans and the harlots believed him. Look at this. And ye, when ye had seen it, repented not afterward that ye might believe him. So you see there that he's using a parable of two people that didn't actually do something, said he was going to do it, didn't, said he wasn't going to do it, and did it. But then he's likening this to the salvation message is, yeah, these publicans and harlots don't really you know, pay attention or whatever, but they actually believe and they're going. You say you believe, but you don't actually believe because when you heard John's preaching, you didn't repent. 
that you actually follow the true God and believe on what John was saying, right? That's why Jesus said to them, if you had believed Moses, you would have believed me. This is what he's talking about. So you see this repentance is a repentance of dead works. It's the repentance of the, for the remission of sins, which is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, just before I end, I just want to just address just two common questions because um, these are ones I often come across, and if you understand these questions and the answers to them, they might help you. <clears throat> two common questions. Somebody might say this. Somebody will say, Victor, like how, can, how can you believe in Jesus and not change? They'll say that. Right? And not only is it, there's two, there's two ways to sort of answer this question. One is to understand what happens when you get saved, which is you have a spirit and the flesh, and it's a choice which one you walk in. Right? If you walk in the spirit, you're going to change. If you walk in the flesh, you're not going to change. But this decision and this effort is not automatic. I always tell people, and I wish it was. I wish it was automatic, because it would make the Christian life a lot easier. Do you know what I mean? But it's not automatic. And those of us who have been Christians long enough, you know it's not automatic. So if it's not automatic, obviously you can make the wrong choice and you cannot change. And if you don't walk in the Spirit, you're going to be the same person you were before. So how can you believe in Jesus and not change? That's one way. But sometimes, because people have a wrong idea of what it takes to be saved, they also ask this question. They think believing in Jesus means you need to repent of your sins, you need to be willing to keep the commandments, you need to make him the Lord of your life. This is not salvation. Salvation is you make him saviour, right? not make him Lord, because Lord is when you're willing to do what he commands you. Right? That's not salvation. So when they ask this question, they'll say, how can you believe in Jesus? How can you believe and not change? Well, because what I'm believing in order to be saved is not that I have to be willing to keep the commandments. What I'm believing in order to be saved is I have to put my faith on the Lord Jesus Christ and turn from dead works. So really, I have, I have changed. right? How can you believe in Jesus and not change? No, no, you have changed. What's changed is what you believe. But that's not enough for the work salvation crowd. That's the thing. That change is not enough. But that change is what is required for somebody to be saved. And you know what? Somebody can change all their works. They can prophesy in Jesus' name and cast out devils in his name and, and like Matthew 7 says, in his name do many wonderful works. And you know what? If their faith does not change, they do not repent from those dead works, Jesus is just going to say to them, depart from me, I never knew you. So you need to make sure your faith changes. And another one I've heard is when people say, you know, well, unbelief is a sin. So don't you then, and I remember my brother said this to me once, but it's like, yeah, but, but unbelief is a sin. So isn't it right for me to say repent of your sin to be saved because you're repenting of your unbelief? I mean, if you want to, you know, risk somebody misinterpreting what you're saying because they don't know by what you mean by repent of your sin, you're just referring to one sin within that category of sins. Yes, unbelief is a sin then, yeah, I suppose you're not necessarily meaning the wrong thing by what you're saying if you want to get ultra-technical, but, you know, why not just be clear about what they have to repent of and it's believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. So to me, this is like a category error. And it would be like me saying, you know, well, we know salvation, you know, we're justified by faith. But you know that we not only get saved by faith, we receive grace by faith. We actually do works by faith as well. That's why the Bible says people will depart from the faith. Keep the faith. Because part, part that word faith is not only referring to salvation. Faith is believing, but salvation is receiving grace through that belief. But we also walk by faith. So we're actually doing works by faith too. That's the right type of good works because without faith, it's impossible to please Him. So if I said to you, we're justified by faith, but I mean works... You see, I was just saying it's the wrong category that you're using to describe something. So yes, unbelief is a sin, but sin is like the top category, and then underneath that, there are different sins. And this one sin, I guess, that needs to be repented of is a repentance from dead works, a repentance from unbelief. So to me, you know, I guess if somebody means that, and this is often what happens when you talk to people that use the wrong terminology. They'll say, repent of your sins to be saved, 
And if they actually are saved and you pin them down on it, it's like, what do you mean by that? Do you, are you meaning that if somebody's drinking, do they have to be willing to stop drinking in order to be saved? Or can they be saved and still continue to drink? Then they're wrong in continuing to drink and we should help them with that. But they don't have to be willing to keep the commands to be saved. And they'll say, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, like people don't have to keep more of it. So it's like, just be clear in what you mean by salvation. But some people, when they say repent of your sins, they just mean what we believe, which is you admit you're a sinner, you know you are deserving of hell, there's a punishment for your sin, and therefore you need a saviour. That's what you need to acknowledge, to know, to, to, to be saved. But you don't have to have a willingness to turn from those sins. To be saved, that is something that is a daily struggle in the Christian life. So, just in conclusion, you need to remember that repent, to repent, is a verb. So when we're talking about repentance in the Bible, you need to ask yourself the question, well, what is being repented of here? And is it in the context of salvation? Right? So you have repentance from evil, you have repentance from good, you have repentance from sin, and you have repentance from dead work. So you can turn from different things. You don't want to assume that it's always repentance from sin, because otherwise you may have God repenting from sin, and that's obviously not right. So when it comes to salvation, it can't be repentance from sin. It can't be this one, right? Because that's works. So this is why it's this one. And, and all throughout the New Testament, this is very consistent. But what you have to understand is, oftentimes people that are preaching this type of gospel, which is another gospel, right? It's not the true gospel of Jesus Christ. They will go to Old Testament passages, right? You have to understand that Old Testament must be understood in light of the New Testament. And the New Testament is very clear that the righteousness that saves us is by believing on Jesus, not by our own righteousness, by keeping the law. Now, why is this a big deal? This is why this is a big deal. Galatians 5. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you, that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor, to do the whole law. Christ is become of no effect unto you. Whosoever you are justified by the law, you have fallen from grace. Now the danger here is, what's happening here in the Galatian church, and Paul, he, he rebuked it so strongly, and also this is the letter that he even wrote himself. Now some of Paul's letters, he didn't actually write himself. He dictated them, and other people wrote them. But he says at the end of Galatians 5, you behold how large a letter I have written with my own hand. Why? Because it's so important for him to address this issue that he wrote it out himself. And this is the issue of work salvation. Because what was happening in the Galatian church is you had these Judaizers coming in to the church, teaching believers and Gentiles that they had to be circumcised to be saved. They had to add a work to salvation. And Paul made it very clear to them that they risk not being saved if they believe this, right? Because anyone who's not saved that believes this is not saved. He says here, Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. So there is a great danger that people who believe this are not actually saved. Now, does that mean everybody that gets messed up into this is not saved? No, because everybody that believes heresy can fit into two categories. Hopefully, they fit into the category where they are saved and they're just a little mixed up on some things. You can be deceived. You can be deceived into believing a heresy, right? But the danger here is if people are preaching a false gospel, not caring about what their words mean and how people perceive their words, they may end up creating a generation of people that think they're saved and aren't, right? Because they're actually trusting the fact that they've turned from their sins and that's what they think is actually keeping them saved. But they're not actually saved. They're still trusting themselves. They haven't believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. So this is why it's a big deal. Because you can't mix works and grace. You can't have works 99% and grace, you know, or grace 99% and works 1%. It needs to be all grace. And that's why the Bible says here, he says, I testify again to every man that is circumcised, right? you have to do one work, that he is a debtor, to do the whole law. Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever you are justified by grace, 
by, by the law you have fallen from grace. So, do I believe in repentance? Yes. Do I believe in repenting of sins? Yes. But uh, not for the unbeliever. Right? So we repent of dead works to get saved. And as a believer, is our life work is we are turning from our sins and striving to keep God's commandments. So works is a good thing. That's why it's called good works. But you need to make sure uh, it's in the right place, that it's after salvation, not in order to get salvation. All right, let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for so much information on repentance. And uh, Lord, you make it so clear that repentance is not a turning from sin to be saved when it comes to salvation, but it's believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray, Lord, that you help this sermon to help many people understand the different types of repentance in the Bible. And Lord, help them not to be carried away with the false doctrine of work salvation, no matter how it's packaged. And uh, Lord, guide us into all truth. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.